Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can also sign up for my mailing list. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into a sweet, nurturing, calming, soothing sanctuary where you can rest and even drift off to sleep if that is your intention. This podcast is born of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and listening to a sleep podcast every night before I go to sleep. I have a beautiful waking life, and I'm also someone who loves bedtime. I love the feeling of bedtime. I love the ritual of it. I love that time. For me, it's in the early evening. That's just how my circadian rhythm works. But somewhere around seven o'clock, I can feel myself starting to grow more tired and I get my bed ready and I'm usually in bed somewhere between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Now that it's summer and the days are a bit longer, I'm staying up a little bit later than usual, which For me, a wild night is (laughs) 8.30, but I'm up at about 4, and that's just how my system works. I'm fortunate that my husband is on a similar schedule, but he stays up later than I do, but we're both up early in the morning. So I love bedtime, and I have found that listening to sleep podcasts really creates a beautiful bridge between my waking consciousness and that beautiful mystery of sleep. It helps to quiet the rambling thoughts and the busyness of my mind. And it gives me a place where I can gently focus. And I've always loved the experience of someone reading me a story. I don't have any clear memories of that as a child, but I'm sure it happened. My family and my parents have always loved books. So reading in books has always been a part of my life. And I've also always drawn comfort, especially as a child, of hearing my parents downstairs once I was in bed, hearing that soft rumbling of voices or the television just knowing I wasn't alone in the night. And so I think in some ways, listening to sleep podcasts evokes that sense of comfort for me. And oh, how I wish they existed during my sleepless nights of years gone by. But they're here now, and this one is here for you now. And I also know that many of you listen during the day. You get to take the podcast with you when you drive to work or go for walks or do whatever it is you do. So however you choose to listen, you have my blessing. If you are going to use this as a sleep podcast, 
my suggestion is that you turn the volume down lower than you would if you were listening to an audiobook. That's my preference. I like to have to reach for the audio a little bit. And what I do is I use earphones. And they fall out at some point in the night, but I always find them. I set the sleep timer so that it turns off either after 45 minutes or after the episode completes. My preference as a listener is that episodes run at least an hour. There are some sleep podcasts out there that I love, but their episodes are only about 30 minutes and that causes me anxiety because I feel like I have to be asleep by the end. I don't know why it's always felt a bit disheartening to me when I'm awake, when everybody else is asleep. And so there's something about short podcasts that triggers that for me. And so these episodes will be an hour at least. Maybe sometimes they're 55 minutes, but it's still an hour-ish. And if you need more time than that, you can always set up a playlist in your podcast app. And this is episode 171, which means there are a lot of episodes you can choose from. And you can curate your own playlist. And we can keep you company all through the night if that is your desire. So as I record this, it is early morning. That is usually when I record these because things are so quiet. And there's this really gentle breeze. And every time it blows, it's I can see all the, the leaves and the trees and the ivy just gently swaying. And there is something so soothing about it. So here's to the soft, gentle breezes that create sweet movement in our lives, in our hearts, and in the world around us. And I also want to share a piece of prose with you that has been running through my consciousness for a few days now. And I'm wondering if this piece of prose is here for you or one of our listeners. It's one you've likely heard before. It's from Emily Dickinson. And it says, Hope is the thing with feathers. That's, that's the line that has been in my consciousness. It just ends there. I mean, the, the piece of prose doesn't, but the words in my consciousness. For days I've been hearing, hope is the thing with feathers. And so I pulled up the rest of the piece of prose, and, and this is a little bit more of what it says. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And I just so appreciate that wisdom and that encouragement. You know, I know that a lot of you who listen are similar to me in that you are a highly sensitive soul. We're empaths. I feel the world through my heart. And even when life is good, you know, there's not a lot of things stressing me out. I can still feel stressed just because of the collective energies. And it feels as if there is some very, very deep movement happening. And sometimes for me, that can cause some additional layers of anxiousness 
to come up. And I feel like that's what this message is here to remind us, I'll say to remind me, hope is the thing with feathers. The reminder the angels say is even when the weather is cloudy and gray and storming, we know a sunny day is in our future. This line of prose reminds me of that. Hope is the thing with feathers. That we are invited, we are encouraged to believe in brighter tomorrows. That if you're not feeling inspired right now, it does not mean that inspiration will not find you soon. I believe it will. I believe there is an ebb and flow to life. The challenge is, is when we are in the ebb, it can often feel like flow will never return. I think I'm in an ebb right now, just as I say that I'm having this awareness. You'd think I would be incredibly tuned into that, but I'm in an ebb. I'm going to take a deep breath on that. Yes, my friends, I will say I feel as if I am in an ebb. I think of the tides that go out and that leaves the beach visible. And then the flow comes back in. And sometimes on the journey of self-growth and awakening, we think that we have to do something to bring in the tide, to activate the flow. But sometimes that's not the case. Like if I sit outside, when things are still, at some point the breeze will come. And just as I said that, a breeze whooshed through all the leaves and the trees. So I will say for myself, I'm in an ebb right now. There are things percolating. There are certainly things that are incubating within me that I look forward to bringing into the world and sharing. But I'm also feeling a lot of stillness right now. And that's not always comfortable. Because I go into this belief system that I'm doing something wrong. If I'm not plugged into the flow of life, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I have gotten off the rails somehow. Intellectually, I know that that's not true. But it feels true sometimes, yes? Our feelings are not always based in reality, right? Our feeling body is informed by so many different factors. There's our hormones, our neurochemicals, there's the activity around us, the collective, the weather, our circumstances. So hope is the thing with feathers. And one of the things I love so much about working with the angels is they hold that for us. That even those moments when hope feels elusive, the angels will hold it in our name. They hold our prayers aloft. They seed our dreams. They plant tokens of magic for our future. So wherever you are in the ebb and flow of life, Receive the blessings of this moment. It doesn't mean you have to seek out the blessings. It means that blessings are here for you. That the blessings are being seated in your name and love is here for you. And so I'm going to call the angels in. They are already here. But I love sharing the ritual of bringing them in with you 
so that you know they are here as well. So let's take another deep breath in as we gently call ourselves forward into the heart of God. And beautiful angels on high, I am so deeply grateful for this beautiful sanctuary you are cultivating for us. And I ask that you join us here, even though I know you are already here with every word and every breath. I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love, of goodness, of gentleness, and of light. And I ask that you send blessings to each of our beloveds listening to this broadcast. And everyone just take a lovely deep breath in and just release. The angels are with us now. They are with you now. Their energy is soft and sweet and comforting. They are doing a clearing for you. They are showing me that they are clearing our throat chakras so that it is easier to connect with the authentic voice, the authentic truth of all that we are. And they are also bringing an infusion of light to your solar plexus, helping you to center in your authentic self in the light of your beingness. They are also doing a clearing up and down your back, helping to release any tension that you may be carrying in your back. And just breathe, especially into your shoulder blades, the area where your shoulders are. Connecting with your divinity, your light, the greater expanse of all that you are as a divine being in human form. You are a big, beautiful, bright soul. And allow yourself to connect with your life force because it is bright and true. And allow your life force, your light body, to bring light to your physical body. Allowing your physical body to receive the blessings of this moment. Allowing waves of relaxation to flow over you. And if you are preparing for sleep, we affirm that you have done enough for this day. And this is your time to rest. And the beautiful mystery of sleep is here for you. And your angels will watch over you as you rest. They will take good care of you They will help clear your energy field and help you connect with waves of inspiration that will support you in your waking life. So we invite you to snuggle on in, cozy on up. And while you rest, I'm going to read to you and share with you some stories. And my beautiful friends, as promised, this is part two of flipping through the TV guide from November 29th, 1978. 
part one is in the last episode. But just to bring you up to speed, I am flipping through this and connecting with memories that I have of that time. I would be 16 years old. It would be right after Thanksgiving and right before the Christmas and Hanukkah. (laughs) Important to me at that age. The Hanukkah holidays. And in the last episode, we went through the first part of the issue and got up through Tuesday evening. And now we're at Wednesday. So again, around this time, I'm probably in school, not getting home until about 3, 3.30. I might have had to work. At that age, I was working at Montgomery Wards, the department store. So I might have been working. But usually, I was interested in daytime programming from three o'clock on. And we would choose between the different talk shows. So Dinah, meaning Dinah Shore, of course, her guests are Tim Conway, Ursula Andrus, and singer Stephen Bishop and psychologist Wayne Dyer. Stephen Bishop, if you remember, he's famous for a couple of songs. And then Wayne Dyer, who was probably getting his start right around then. Merv Griffin has guests from Beyond the Poseidon Adventure. So those kinds of big event disaster movies were really a thing back then. The Towering Inferno, Poseidon Adventure, and apparently now Beyond the Poseidon Adventure with Michael Caine, Tally Savalas, Jack Warden, Mark Harmon, and Shirley Jones. I didn't know Mark Harmon was in that. I'm always looking for a good Mark Harmon sighting. Mike Douglas has Charlton Heston, Buddy Greco, and Gadget Man Stan Kahn, and they join co-host Debbie Boone. And how many of you remember her big hit? You Light Up My Life. I remember they played that song endlessly (laughs) for a long time. And she is Pat Boone's daughter. And if you're not into those kinds of talk shows, then there's lots of things in syndication, including Mary Tyler Moore, Bionic Woman, Six Million Dollar Man, Emergency, I Dream of Jeannie, Brady Bunch. So lots of things that you can choose from. It looks like there is also another episode of Dinah that's on a little bit later with guests Angie Dickinson, Robert Wagner, Dennis Weaver, Charles Nelson Riley, and Luciano Pavarotti, who my mom loved Luciano. And it does look like this Wednesday night, back in 1978, there was a two-hour Eight is Enough special. Tom and Abby's first anniversary is thrown into turmoil when Nicholas runs away. And then on the opposite page, there is a close-up about something that is airing on great performances on PBS, which is Mikhail Baryshnikov dancing. So again, 16-year-old me would not have cared about that. 25-year-old me would have been watching that and recording that for sure. But back then, we did not have a VCR and I did not care. So we were not watching that. But he's dancing the title role in Balanchine's The Prodigal Son, a classic 1929 work. Also airing on Wednesday night is The Jeffersons. In this episode, Louise loses her memory as well as her money as the result of a mugging. And I will say, they have such a great theme song. Okay, so more about this very special Eight is Enough episode. Feeling responsible for a fire. Ooh, that sounds, that sounds not good. Feeling responsible for a fire that destroys his room, Nicholas decides the family would be better off without him and hops a bus for San Diego, a special two-hour episode. And if eight is enough, 
two-hour special is not your thing, there's also some movies airing, including Billy Jack and a made-for-TV movie with Lauren Hutton and David Burney and Adrian Barbeau about a woman well, just going to say she's, okay, it's not good. So a woman is sort of being stalked, and I'm not going to share any more of that with you because it's sleepy bedtime blessings. And and there is a Barbara Walters special, which I don't know if you remember back in the day, but these were a big deal. So to set the stage, so back in 1978, there were the tabloids like National Enquirer or The Sun the star, whatever they were called. But we did not have access to celebrities the way we do now. You know, now with all of the social media and everything being so curated, we know a lot about celebrities. Back then, their image and their availability to the public was carefully curated. So The Barbara Walters interviews were always fascinating to watch, and I would almost always watch them. So this one has Alan Alda from MASH. So it says, who would think that MASH's bachelor Hawkeye never looks at another woman? Meet writer, director, star Alan Alda in a rare television interview. So they are likely referring to his long-lived marriage. And then there's something about Diana Ross. So Diana Ross will be interviewed as well as Steve Martin. So it says about Diana Ross, who has fame, fans, and millions. But there's one thing in her life that's still missing. I don't know. Perhaps she was looking to be happily married at that point. I don't know what they're referring to. For Steve Martin, he's a wild and crazy guy who loves women but really doesn't want to get married. (laughs) Meet Steve Martin and find out why. And then they have King Hussein and Queen Noor of Jordan. He proposed to her over a plate of apples, and today she is the world's only American who is a queen. And just a bit more about that. So on the set of MASH, Alda talks about the strains of jet lag. He commutes home to New Jersey on weekends and his shyness of interviews. Oh, and then for Diana Ross, it says, Ross looks back on the 60s when she toured with the Supremes and at her career since then. If I hadn't had my children with me, a lot of times would have been unbearable. Okay, so we would have probably been watching that. And if you're going to stay up late, Johnny Carson's guest is Phyllis Newman. The other thing I'll reflect on is back in the day, how many of you remember that stations would go off the air in the wee hours of the morning? There would just be bars or something, the color bars, or they would show all of the religious programming. So it was rather depressing if you were up in the middle of the night when the TV stations would be off the air or all you could watch was some televangelist because there was no internet and iPod and Netflix. You were kind of (laughs) stuck. So I have memories of that, of there being nothing on television, and it was the loneliest experience And so we're going to groove on over to Thursday afternoon. So on Dinah, she has Peter Falk and his wife, actress Shira Denise, and Alan Arkin and his wife, Barbara Dana. Merv Griffin has Bob Hope, Don Rickles, and Charlton Heston. Mike Douglas has David Gates as the co-host. I don't know who that is. Guests include Robert Vaughn and Janet Lee. David sings Took the Last Train, so David must be a singer. And again, you can choose from many Mary Tyler Moore episodes, Bionic Woman, Six Million Dollar Man, I Dream of Jeannie, all kinds of good stuff. And we have what might be some of the first holiday programming for that year, 
because Frosty the snowman is airing. A lovable snowman comes to life, but only a little girl's love can save him from melting away. And also Raggedy Ann and Andy in the great Santa Claus caper. At 16, I don't know that we would have watched Frosty the Snowman, but it was always an amazing classic. And just as an aside, Wes, my husband, loves all of those Christmas holiday cartoons. So we always watch them every year. And they're just really happy and sweet. So here's to Frosty the Snowman and Jimmy Durante, who narrates the story and sings the the hit song. I think he sings it, yes? Also airing opposite of that, yeah, this is what we would have been watching, Mork and Mindy, because everyone watched Mork and Mindy then. The death of her gin rummy partner makes a dispirited Cora realize that she too is getting old. So, so a very special Mork and Mindy episode, apparently. Also airing on Thursday night is Hawaii Five O which I don't believe I ever saw an episode of. I know the theme song for sure, but it was never into that show, nor the new revival of it. Quincy is airing with Jack Klugman, and we always liked that show, so I remember watching quite a bit of Quincy, but playing opposite of that was Barney Miller, which is probably what we were watching. So Harris, played by Ron Glass, comes unglued after he is shot at in the line of duty by un- by uniformed officers who reacted on the basis of his color. Wow. So, a really powerful episode, I'm sure. And I just really wonder how much we could take in of that at the time. I always loved Barney Miller. The, the writing on it was was really good. And also Soap is going to be on, which Wes and I just rewatched last year. No sooner do Eunice and Dutch run off together than Chester and the Major turn up missing. Soap was a brilliant show. I loved that. And then coming into the 10 o'clock hour, there is an opportunity to watch Arthur Miller's play Fame with Richard Benjamin. I don't think we would have been watching that. 2020, the news magazine show, but I don't know what they were, what their stories were. And Barnaby Jones, which was always a sweet show. So an old flame asks JR, played by Mark Shearer, for protection from her deranged ex-husband, who will try anything, even violence, to get their marriage back together. And Barnaby Jones, played by Buddy Epson, and Betty is played by Lee Merriweather. It was just a very well done show. And now we're moving on over to Friday. So let's see who is on the talk shows. Di- Charlton Heston is making the rounds. It must be because of that Poseidon adventure movie, I bet. Because he is on Dinah, along with comedian Tom Dreesen and Bruce and Christy Jenner. And Annie composer Charles Strauss with actresses Andrea McArdle and Patricia Ann Patz. So this must have been in the heyday of Annie. And Andrea McArdle was the first Annie and was singing The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow everywhere. And we, of course, all loved her. Merv Griffin has also Bruce and Christy Jenner, so they must have been making the rounds back then. Of course, now um, it is Caitlyn Jenner. So, so when I say, when I use her old name, it is not meant to be a sign of disrespect. I'm just reading the television listings from that time. But of course, she is Caitlyn Jenner. So I want to acknowledge that. Also airing in the afternoon is the fabulous movie, It Happened One Night. Now, 16-year-old me wouldn't have cared about that. 
but 61 year old me would be delighted to be flipping stations to find it happened one night playing randomly at some point. Of course, that is the movie with Claudette Colbert and Clark Gable. And you know what? I think it's from this movie. There is a a very interesting factoid. So this is the one where she is the heiress and she's running away from her father. And Clark Gable is the reporter on her trail. So they're sharing a hotel room and they put a sheet over a clothesline to separate the beds. And I think it's in this movie where Clark Gable takes off his shirt and he's not wearing an undershirt. And back in the day, so this would be 1934, men wore undershirts under their dress shirts. So when Clark Gable took off his dress shirt and there was no undershirt, apparently the sales for undershirts plummeted in the months following this movie. I don't know why that's staying in my brain, but just a little interesting piece of information for you. I think it's from this movie. On Mike Douglas, he's having England Dan and John Ford Coley. And earlier in the week, he had Seals and Crofts. So lots of good musicians on Mike Douglas that week. He also has Catherine Witt, Pat Klaus, and Connie Selica, and Howard Platt of Flying High, and Hervé Villachez, of course, from Fantasy Island. I haven't really mentioned much about the game shows, but, you know, they were a big deal back then. We have Newlywed Game, which I will say a lot of the double entendres from the Newlywed Game escaped me at that point. Family Feud and others. Oh, there's another episode of Dinah with, again, Dinah Shore, John Ritter, Bonnie Franklin, Billy Crystal, Mark Hamill, and Gene Stapleton. That would have been a fascinating panel. All of them are such good actors. That would have been great to watch. Gong Show. How many many of you remember the Gong Show? And the celebrities on the Gong Show panel are Dick Sean, June Allison, and Pat Paulson. They are the judges. Hollywood Squares. The celebrities for this episode are Victor Borgia, Diane Carroll, Mac Davis, Melissa Gilbert, George Goebel, and of course, Paul Lind in the center square, always, Carl Reiner, Joan Rivers, and Jimmy Walker. I always liked Hollywood Squares. And then we go into prime time. So Wonder Woman is airing. And just so you know, we still watch Wonder Woman. Wes loves that. And it's on, I think, either Saturday or Sunday mornings. Sometimes there's one or two episodes on that we watch. An unscrupulous land developer steals a Navy-trained dolphin as part of a plan to acquire prize beachfront property. So it involved a dolphin as well, which that would always be fun to watch. Not for the dolphin, clearly. And these days I wouldn't think it's fun. I just mean 16-year-old me would have enjoyed seeing a dolphin. And probably we're not watching Wonder Woman. That was not a show that we watched at our house. But there were other good things on. So again, keeping with the holiday theme, we have Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. So it's a 1968 Oscar winner, and it follows Christopher Robin and his animal friends as a storm topples Owl's treehouse and brings a drenching rain. At 16 years old, I wouldn't have been interested in that because... I would have been watching Donnie and Marie, which was also airing then. So Suzanne Somers, Paul Lind, and Betty White are the guests. Comedy includes a musical takeoff on Heaven Can Wait, which was such a good movie with Warren Beatty. I love that movie. Paul and Betty as bickering aerialists. Betty's attempt to explain the metric system to children. And Paul 
as the agent for an all-girl country band. And they had ice skaters. Do you remember? Didn't they on Donnie and Marie? I think they had ice skaters or something like that. Billy Graham Crusade is on. I guarantee you that never saw a second of airtime in our house. And Battlestar Galactica. So a recon mission turns up some astonishing news. Another Battlestar exists. Oh, this must be... I read this. I'm sorry. You don't know what I'm talking about. But I read this description for this episode in the last episode. I don't know if this is part two, but basically Lloyd Bridges is the other commander. It looks like all in the family's on, but this might be syndication. It says no sooner does Archie discover counterfeit bills in his cash box than Edith calls from the police station where she is under arrest for trying to pay for Archie's new underwear with a phony $10 bill. Also airing, so right after Wonder Woman came Incredible Hulk with, of course, Bill Bixby in the classic role. While passing through a small Arizona town, David, played by Bill Bixby, is framed for murder by a corrupt policeman who are trying to cover up their crime. Also airing is Rockford Files. This is what we would have been watching in all likelihood. The trail leads to a car dealer as Rockford investigates murder and bribery in the fight game. There is some college football airing. Again, again, would not have watched. And again, if it's a Friday night, I am probably out with friends. Unless the weather was bad, then we probably weren't out and about. At 10 o'clock, flying high is on, which I seem to remember was about flight attendants. Pam, Lisa, and Captain March find romance and its complications at a Palm Springs resort. Oh, Charo is a guest on this, and Vincent Van Patten. I, I might have watched that, but I wouldn't have been happy about it. And the Eddie Capra Mysteries with James Whitmore Jr. I don't know. Not much good showing on this particular Friday night. They are not telling us who is on Johnny Carson's couch for this particular particular episode. Then there's a bunch of movies airing. Oh, the Midnight Special. So the Midnight Special was a music show that would air... It's not even airing at midnight. It's airing at 1 1, 1 (laughs) a.m. Wolfman Jack is host for an all-disco show with guests Sheik, Sylvester, Rick James, Patty Brooks, and Laura Taylor. And if you're up late, you can watch things like Curse of the Swamp Creature, heading a swampland to search for oil, a geologist finds adventure in the form of a mad doctor. Soul Train is also on in the wee hours of the morning. The movie The Wild One with Marlon Brando is on if you can't sleep. Medical Center, again, say it with me, Chad Everett is so cute. So not that I would be up that late, but that would be a good choice. And lots of horror movies. So I'm going to read all of these to you for my friend David, who loves horror and listens to the podcast. So David, this is for you. So we have The Mummy's Revenge, standard horror yarn about the living dead. A mummy seeks a body for his wife's soul. And there's also House Horror, a horror house, sorry, a little dyslexic, horror house. A haunted house party becomes the setting, okay, for bad stuff. I'm not going to read all of that to you. Then horror rises from the tomb. So a whole lovely expanse of horror movies. And if, if you can't handle horror, Marcus Welby's on. Much better. I always love these medical dramas. So, or Bewitched. Bewitched is always a good choice. Although, I don't know if you will remember my rant about Bewitched. 
But as a 61-year-old mystical magical woman, the premise of Bewitched now bugs me. Because here she is, a witch with incredible powers, and her husband won't let her use her magic, and that she cannot be responsible for her own power. She cannot be trusted with her own power. Terrible messaging, but I love the show. And that wraps up the programming for the week, but but wait, we're not done. Now we've got articles, we've got a crossword puzzle to go through. So this is the big article about Suzanne Summers, who is at her heyday from Three's Company. And it talks about her agent, Jay Bernstein, who also managed Farrah Fawcett, who was at that point known as Farrah Fawcett Major. So he has these two major stars on his roster. And the article talks about that he's driving from his home in Bel Air, which he rents for $1,500 a week, which would be the equivalent of $6,000 a month, which back in that day was incredibly expensive. And they also managed to throw in that he's buying a $29 bottle of Dom Perignon on his way to Suzanne Summers' home. It also says that a little more than a year ago, she was the third lead in a mid-season television situation comedy, Three's Company. So that's when the show premiered and she was earning $2,750 a week back then and now for a month's work in April she made $166,667 for the first of six movies for television um, for CBS and Paramount offered her $300,000 for three movies. So that just gives you a sense on what things cost before and what a lot of money might look like back then. I also have to say, I've always really admired Suzanne Summers for her, for the way she has reinvented herself time and time again. How many of you remember the Thigh Master back in what, the 80s? So in some ways, she helped drive the infomercial train back in the day with her infomercials for the Thigh Master. She then went on to develop product lines for either QVC or HSN. I don't remember which one she was a part of, but she would be on one of those stations all weekend selling different products she or and her team I'm assuming had developed whether they were beauty products or food products skin care clothing I remember being interested in watch I always thought she was very interesting whenever she was on one of those stations again before there were a lot of options and I would never buy anything but I would watch her talk about whatever it was she was selling back in the day. Oh, and this is interesting. This must be around the time that Battlestar Galactica premiered because there is a review for it. It says 20th Century Fox, the maker of Star Wars, has sued the makers of this ABC space saga because they allegedly stole from the movie. If that's true, they didn't steal enough. All they got away with was the hardware. Ooh, that's a harsh review. So the three-hour premiere of Battlestar Galactica was television's Cleopatra. So I guess Battlestar Galactica had just premiered recently. I'll just read, I'll just read you the last line because it's funny. Nobody on the Galactica reads, paints, collects pepper shakers, or says anything witty. Mainly they flirt, play cards, and eat a lot of protein. <laughs> if they weren't so busy with the Cylons, they would probably jog. He really doesn't like this series. He doesn't know it's going to become a classic soon. 
Now we're on to one of my favorites, which is the TV Guide crossword puzzle. And this is so interesting. Did, did I not just say in this episode that I'm in the ebb, the ebb of life? Because one across, four letters for Wanes, W-A-N-E-S, is ebbs. How bizarre and cool is that? How often have I used that word in a podcast only to find that it is the first clue, the first answer in a crossword puzzle in TV Guide from 1978? I just think that is kind of cool. So I'm going to do a little high-fiving with the angels here. Okay, let's see what else we can get. So 17 across is $100,000 blank that tune. Of course, that would be name. Writer Vidal, V-I-D-A-L, would be Gore Vidal. Robert Urich series. I think it must be Vegas at this time. Let's see. Vegas. Yes. Five letters. Vegas. Got that one. I'm feeling very, very wise right now. 55 across is blank Guthrie. That would be Arlo Guthrie. Thank you. I love, I feel so smart. (laughs) Here's one I know you'll get. Seven across. The bad news blank. The bad news bears. Yay. Look how smart we are. So always a joy in the television crossword in TV Guide. Then there is a big ad on the inside back cover for the General Electric Television. It says technology is changing the way America adjusts to color. In 1977, General Electric won an Emmy for being the first to use broadcasters VIR color signal in home television. I have no idea what that does, but apparently it does good stuff. Flesh tones, backgrounds, blue skies, and green grass are automatically adjusted for you by the computer-like circuitry. And the television itself is like a giant honking piece of furniture. It's got this big oak-like cabinet with the speakers on the side. So I probably all had a TV like this at some point, I would imagine. And it's just, there's also an article that says kind of what's coming up. So Sonny Bono is going to play a pop music composer who turns detective in Murder in the City, an upcoming NBC movie. Leslie Uggams, Yul Brenner, Ethel Merman, Imogene Coca, and Michael Jackson will join a new Muppet, a dog named Barkley, for Christmas with Friends of Sesame Street on CBS. Oh, that would have been lovely. Frank Reynolds and an NBC crew recently returned from China, where they were the first Western TV journalists allowed to look at the education of China's youth. Yeah, back then it was very rare for any journalists to get to go into China. Oh, this one looks good. Linda Pearl of the Young Pioneers is in the army now as a female cadet in Women of West Point. The CBS... TV movie is being filmed at the now co-educational U.S. Military Academy. This is the reason I was interested. Also in the cast are Andrew Stevens, who I thought was adorable. I don't know if he's married to Kate Jackson at this point. And Jameson Parker, who I also thought was adorable. And actual cadets are serving as extras. 
And there's going to be an upcoming Jacques Cousteau visit to Easter Island. I was always up for a Jacques Cousteau special. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of this TV guide issue from 1978. So I hope you enjoyed our time in the Wayback Machine. I still have more TV guides to flip through with you, including one that has Jeannie Francis on the cover. And if you know, you know, she played Laura Weber, eventually Laura Spencer, and many other last names on General Hospital. So I do have that issue, and I have a bunch of issues from the early 1960s. So there will be, for sure, more TV Guide episodes in our collective future, as well as some wonderful old cookbook recipes. And I have a Neiman Marcus Christmas catalog from the 70s that we will flip through. So lots of good episodes coming up. And if you are enjoying this podcast, I would love it if you would leave a review on iTunes and tell some friends about it so we can ripple this wave of goodness far and wide. But for now, I wish you sweet dreams and thank you so much for listening. It is truly a blessing getting to keep you company. So we'll talk again soon. And thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be with you.